All right, so this is it. The most important contribution to mankind I could possibly hope to do in my life. This is the definitive metal argument. Megadeth versus Metallica. Who is the better artist? Who is the better band? Well, let's find out, shall we? Bear with me, let's get to it. In this video, I hope to settle the most important debate in metal nearly 40 years after it began, once and for all. I've been a huge fan of both bands ever since I was 12, with all their albums burned onto my iPod Classic. I would listen to them over and over and over again. My first concert was Metallica, and my second one was Megadeth. Both of them my mom took me to. Uh, I was a little bit too young. Rest in peace, my mom. I miss you. I love you. But so this question has just been on my mind this whole time. You know, what is a better band? You know, you'll read on it on forums. You know, maybe you'll debate with this with friends. Who is the better band? So to try to settle this, I went back and listened to every single Megadeth album and every single Metallica album. So we will be going through all Metallica albums and all the Megadeth albums, assigning them a rating out of 30 based on several criteria and then summing up all the scores giving us the final say on what band is better, Metallica or Megadeth. Brace yourselves, grab a beverage, this is going to be a long one, let's get to it guys. We will only be focusing on music released by the bands for the most part. I won't be really touching any drama that they got into, live shows, or any other outside factors. You know, I don't really care for this uh, review at least of what was going on with band members, etc, etc. Uh, let's just focus on the music, shall we? I will get into the scoring methodology here shortly, but first let me just say this took a lot of work. If you could hit that sub button and that like button, it'd be great. And for all of you who haven't subscribed yet, you know, what are you doing? Come on, come join the party. We're having a good time here, talking about metal stuff, all the metal nerd stuff. Come nerd out with me. Let's have a good time, you guys. Come on, come join the party. Let's go. Methodology. So we will be going through the albums in chronological order. So how are we going to score these albums in order to rank them? Well, after listening to all the albums, I was thinking quite deeply about this. Obviously, no matter what I do, my personal bias will creep into these scores. You know, it is my video. If you want to make your own, please go ahead. You know, I fully encourage you to do that. So to counteract that, I split the ranking into three categories, which would be given a score out of 10. Also, each album will be judged based on the original release and not the remaster unless otherwise noted. If you want to check more about that, go see my video on the Megadeth remasters I made. Link will be in the description. First off will be my own personal score out of 10. I'll give just a few short sentences and maybe a short review of the album, but this is going to be a long enough video as it is, so I don't really want to get too in-depth and do like a full review of the album, because otherwise this will be like six hours long instead of two hours long. But, uh, you know, if you do want a full review, maybe leave that album in the comments, and maybe I'll consider doing it. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Anyways, the scoring is out of 10, which 10 is being a classic, perfect, or near-perfect album, and 1 being pretty much an unlistenable album. Secondly, we will use an averaged rating from people all around the world. For this, we will use the Rate Your Music album ratings, times it by 2, and then round it up to either the nearest uh, whole number or 0.5 decimal. I'm not going to try to get into 0.3s and 0.2s, etc, etc. It'll either be, you know, 10 or 9.5, for example. This should hopefully help even out my personal taste of the album with an average rating from thousands of others. I will also give my own rating before looking at the Rate Your Music rating in order to give a little bit less of a bias number, you know, if you, if you read about an album before even listening to it, it can influence your thoughts, etc., if that makes any sense to you guys. And thirdly, for the last 10 points, we'll call this intangibles. I will explain this category as I score the albums, but in general, we will rate this out of 10 based on the sales, influence, importance, fame, or infamy, reputation, and other many factors of the albums. You know, we can't ignore these factors if we're trying to score these when it comes to how these albums are perceived by society. You know, for instance, everybody knows that St. Anger very much damaged the reputation of Metallica and that the Black Album is one of the best-selling albums of all time. So this will factor into that intangible score, but like I said, I will get into that once we get to there. Thus, every album can get a maximum of 30 points. But for the astute among you, you may be thinking, hey wait, Megadeth has 16 albums and Metallica only has 11. How is this fair at all? Well, to counteract this, I will include Metallica's s and Garage Days Revisited, and Lulu. This will bring the total to 14 albums for Metallica and 16 for Megadeth, which I believe is fair. If you release more original music, you should be rewarded. 
So after this, we will tally up all the points for each and then divide by the number of releases to get the final percentage. You know, the final grade as it is, right? So if you scored like 10, you know, 30 out of 30 for every album, you'll get a score of 100%. Or if you score, or for example, if you scored 15 out of 30 for all your albums, you will get a score of 50%. Whoever has the highest percentage grade mark at the end wins. Simple as. But, uh, you know, we'll also tally up the points at the end and use that for more information and to help determine a winner. You know, for once and for all, who is the better band, Metallica or Megadeth? Without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so let's start off with Kill 'em All, released on July 25th, 1983. I mean, there's not much to say about this album besides it being one of the groundbreaking albums in metal. Combining new wave of British heavy metal riffs and melodies with hardcore punk tempos and energy, that is the word I would best use to describe this album. Energy. Non-stop, relentless, youthful energy. When re-listening to it, I was pleased with just how charming James's vocals are. His voice is cracking in places and is absolutely untrained and unhinged. Good stuff. Solos are pretty good. You know, I know Dame Stain wrote a lot of these solos and Kurt would just rehearse them and then played them on the album, but, you know, I don't really care. This is what is on the Metallica album, so I'll be judging it as Metallica, not Dave Mustaine, whatever. Just so we can get that right out of the way, right off the bat. I also love how bright and forward the drums are. The drums sound really good here. Uh, the production is actually pretty decent for a debut album from 1983. My favorite tracks here would be Motor Breath, Metal Militia, Whiplash, and Phantom Lord. For being such a classic and groundbreaking album, I actually still think it holds up decently well. Musically, I'll give it an 8 out of 10. And the Rate Your Music rating as of December 23rd, 2023 is a 3.78. Or when times by two and rounded up, 7.5 out of 10. For the intangibles category, this is absolutely one of the most important releases in metal history. This album is just really good and very, very important for metal. You know, where would we be without Kill Em All? You know, where would we be without those four ugly dudes on the back cover? Like, you know, what can you say? This is just an extremely important album. I will give it an extra point as I actually like the Four Horsemen better than the Mechanics. The Mechanics lyrics are just a little bit goofy. It's a little bit too fast. You know, I kind of like the slower, more punishing, chugging the Four Horsemen. I'll give it a 9 out of 10 intangible score. So in total, we have my score of 8 out of 10, a Rate Your Music average score of 7.5 out of 10, and an intangible score of of 9 out of 10 for a total of 24.5 points out of a possible 30. A pretty good start for Metallica, to be honest. Let's be honest here. Ride the Lightning, released on July 27th, 1984. All right, so one year later, we got Ride the Lightning, a complete step up in everything from Kill 'em All, from production to riffs to aesthetic to the lyrics and songwriting, a true bona fide classic. Right away with the opening clean intro to Fight Fire With Fire, you can tell this is a much more serious album. Right away with the opening clean guitar riff intro acoustic to Fight Fire With Fire, you can just tell that something's a little bit different about this album. And then once the first riff comes in for Fight Fire With Fire, oh man, goosebumps. Man, is it ever good. The riffage here is incredible and precise. Really, really good. The album takes a much more dark, progressive, and serious tone compared to Kill 'Em All one which fits the band well. James's vocals are great, not nearly as unhinged as they were in Kill 'Em All, but here they are much better executed. His voice matured very nicely here. He sounds great, especially on For Whom the Bell Tolls, where he's just absolutely maniacal. Probably one of the best bass performances ever put to tape is on here as well. Solos are cool. I really like the end solos in Fate to Black, which speaking of, we got the first Metallica ballad. Much more dynamics on here as well compared to Kill 'Em All, which I personally love. You know, Fade to Black is an absolute classic. You get played on the radio even still to this day. To hear this in 1984 must have been pretty crazy to hear for the first time. You know, if you were around for this, let me know what it was like. You know, what was it like putting it, I guess it may be your cassette or vinyl, and hearing Fight Fire with Fire for the first time. Say that five times fast. Oof. But yeah, let me know in the comments if you're around for that. I'm interested. But yeah, essentially take everything from Kill 'Em All, mature it, and improve on it in every way. Fantastic stuff. I enjoy every second of this album from front to back. Favorite tracks? For Whom the Bell Tolls, Fade to Black, and Fight Fire with Fire. For me, I'm giving Ride the Lightning a 9.5 out of 10. Really, really good stuff here. With a Rate Your Music score of 
0.08 out of 10 or round it up to 8 out of 10. And then intangibles. You know, this record is probably even more important than Kill Em All. I mean, for crying out loud, I still hear For Whom the Bell Tolls at hockey games. And occasionally you'll hear Fade to Black on the radio. An absolutely iconic, groundbreaking, genre-defining album with iconic album art and transcending songs. Incredibly important record. So I'm going to give it a 9 out of 5 intangible score. So the total score for Ride the Lightning would be my score, 9.5 out of 10. Rate your music average score, 8 out of 10. And then an intangible score of 9.5 out of 10. For a total of 27 out of 30. A really, really good score right off the bat for Metallica. Good stuff. Killing is my business and business is good. Released on June 12th, 1985. So a little less than a year after Metallica's Red Lighting, we get Killing Is My Business, the first album by Megadeth. You know, Dave's retaliation after being kicked out of the band. You know, if Kill Em All was energy, then Killing Is My Business is fury. This record is just frothing with anger. You can tell from the first nasty and technical riff from Last Rite's Love to Death and Dave's absolutely unhinged scream following it that you were listening to something a little bit different and a little bit more interesting than the average thrash release. You know, I'm listening to the original version here. Despite myself preferring the sound of the 2004 remaster, the production here is rough to say the least. I feel like a lot of the impact and violence of these songs is lessened by the terrible production. The guitars are barely distorted. It's more of a crunch tone. Thankfully, that does get fixed on the remaster, however. The drumming is great. Gar Samuelson is a great drummer. And he sort of seems to just slide all over the kit rather than Lars's, you know, more caveman approach, I guess you could say. Bass is great as Dave Elfson plays some interesting parts, especially on the title track. The riffage is pretty decent and most of the songs are at a blistering pace. Decent solos, but I don't know, not very many memorable ones. The things that stand out to me the most is Dave's vocals. You know, I know that I throw the word unhinged around a lot during these reviews here, but that is exactly the word I would use to describe these vocals. He is snarling and barking out all the lyrics here, with some very cool, full-on voice-cracking screams, which, to be honest, are quite sorely missing from after this. Both James and Dave did that in the first albums. It's interesting. All the songs are nice and short and don't overstay their welcome at all, but the songwriting isn't quite here yet. The cover of These Boots is pretty cringe, to be honest. Instant skip every time. And like I said earlier, I like the speed of the mechanics, but the lyrics are just plain silly, so I actually prefer the Four Horsemen. My favorite tracks here are Rattlehead, Looking Down the Cross, and Last Rites, Love to Death. Uh, my rating is 6 out of 10 for the original, and I'll give a 7 out of 10 for the remaster as it sounds a little bit better. So I'll split the difference at 6.5 out of 10. The Rate Your Music rating is a 3.46, so times by 2 rounded up is a 7 out of 10. And then we'll get to the intangible score here. You know, this record, I don't think it's as influential or as important as less than a year later. They would shortly surpass it in just about every measure. But regardless, it is still a very important album, showing that Dave Mustaine was not giving up and that perhaps he could be a serious challenger to Metallica one day. Still a very important record, but Peace Cells really just overshadows it. Bonus points for saying the band's name in a song, which is in Rattlehead. I love that. That's a great uh, 7 out of 10 intangible score. So in total, we have my score of 6.5 out of 10 with the Rate Your Music score, 7 out of 10, with an intangible score of 7 out of 10 for 20.5 points out of 30, which is, uh, you know, fairly decent right off the bat for, Meta uh, for, for Megadeth. Man, I'm going to get that mixed up the whole video, I know. All right, so Master of Puppets, which was released on March 3rd, 1986. It is a little bit uh, crazy to think that Metallica was already on their third album before Megadeth had even put out their second. It's kind of interesting to think that. But, you know, I mean, it's Master of Puppets. I don't really know exactly what I can say that would add to the conversation here. Everybody knows how good this is. Everybody knows that this is an absolute classic in the metal scene. And, you know, it's a true classic in every sense of the word. Here, Metallica leans even further into the progressive elements. They even thank Rush in the liner notes of the album. 
The sound is even darker than before and takes on a theme that will become familiar with Metallica going forward. That is of rebelling against control over one's own agency. You know, more iconic album art. The riffs are more intense. The harmony is more beautiful. The vocals more angry and refined. You know, Battery is an absolute masterclass in rhythm playing. This is probably easily Lars's best and most creative drumming. And Kirk's probably best solos, to be honest, too. You know, I really, really like the solo in The Thing That Should Not Be. He does a great job there. That's a very evil solo. Again, Cliff Burton's bass is monstrous, and it's always doing something interesting. You know, again, I mean, I'm struggling to find new and novel things to say about this album. Everybody knows it's amazing. Everybody knows it's great. What more can I say? Favorite tracks, Battery, Disposable Heroes, and Welcome Home Sanitarium. Easy 10 out of 10. With a Rate Your Music rating of 8 out of 10. And then for Intangibles, you know, I mean, this is a 10. Do I need to say more? Master of Puppets, the song, despite being a lengthy, progressive thrash epic, charted a few years ago when Netflix shows it in their show Stranger Things. It's insanely iconic, insanely influential. Again, a true classic in every sense of the word. And I'm not sure if there's another album that rightfully deserves a 10 more than this. So 10 out of 10, intangible. So for the total score, we have mine, 10 out of 10, rate your music, 8 out of 10, and then intangibles. 10 out of 10 for a final score of 28 out of 30. Really good, like crazy good. That's an amazing score. And will this be the highest score we will see? You know, let's find out, shall we? But uh, do you see how the like button hasn't been pressed? Can you, uh, can you press that for me if you don't mind? Just, just hit the button if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Helps me out, helps the channel. This is the last time I'm going to ask. Let's, go, let's move on. Peace sells, but who's buying? Released September 19th, 1986. Released just six months after Master of Puppets, we get the Megadeth classic, Peace Cells. This record here just steps up and refines everything that was going on in Killing Is My Business. Similar to Metallica, the band incorporates more progressive elements in the music. The album is a ferocious 35 minutes long, and most of the songs feel like they are longer, but in a good way. Here, now instead of silly, goofy lyrics, we get more focused, political, macabre, and blasphemous lyrics, absolutely dripping with Dave Mustaine's rotten attitude. In comparison, and maybe on purpose, the album starts with a bang with Wake Up Dead, which is in stark comparison to the intro to Battery. Might be something going on there. Anyways, Wake Up Dead comes in and instantly we just have the new attitude and some sick riffs and just right in your face. Much more of a mature and serious vocal approach here as well. We get Dave Mustaine's signature snarl here on full show. The guitar riffs are much better. The songwriting is much better. The solos are much more creative, especially in Wake Up Dead. The bass playing is great and creative, and the lyrics go from political to full-on bloodthirsty. The jazz influence of Chris Poland and Gar Samuelson really begin to shine here on this record. Absolute classic thrash material. Really good. But again, Megadeth continues the trend of needless and out-of-place covers. Like, I mean, this album is only 35 minutes long. Did we really need a cover song? Anyways, besides the cover, it's a near-perfect album for me. Favorite tracks, Wake Up Dead, My Last Words, and Good Morning Black Friday. You know, I'll give this album a 9 out of 10, easily. Uh, rate your music score of 3.83 or 7.66, which will round down to a 7.5 out of 10, which to me is absolutely criminal. Intangibles, this is another very highly influential album. You know, uh, 1986 was just a fantastic year for metal. Megadeth get bonus points for having some of the first music videos made for thrash metal as well. The lyrical content and ferocity of some of the tracks certainly influenced a lot of extreme metal. Before this record, Megadeth could have just been another LA thrash band, but uh, Peace Cells made a huge statement. We'll give it a 9 out of 10 intangible score. So in total, we have my score, which is 9 out of 10. Rate your music, 7.5 out of 10 and then an intangible score of 9 out of 10. For a total score of 25.5 points out of 30. You know, a really good showing for Megadeth. They're, uh, they're pumping it out, getting those numbers up, doing some really good stuff. Next, we have So Far, So Good, So What, which was released on January 19th, 1988. Continuing the trend of albums with ellipses in the title and having long, long album title names, we get Megadeth's third album. 
Replacing half the band, it has a distinct shift in sound, much less jazzy and progressive, and more loaded with punk and more rock influences. This album is probably Megadeth's most thrash album, and is again loaded with anger and attitude. You know, I find this album to be a mixed bag. I will be judging the original version, so the first thing that I noticed right away is the stereotypical 80s gated reverb snare. I mean, it's huge, it's loud, it's, it's present in the mix. Y you can't ignore it. The production of the album is a lot like the album art. It's a bit fuzzy, it's muffled, it's kind of hard to make out what's happening here. You know, everything's sort of bleeding into each other from reverb. It's just a bit of a mess, really. Everything's just saturated in reverb. You know, it isn't my favorite production to be sure, but at the very least, it has its charm compared to the other 1988 releases, such as And Justice for All and South of Heaven. This sounds, you know, ancient and passe. It sounds like it came out in like 1982 or something. You know, let me know what you thought of the production in the comments. The remastered version kind of fixes it, but not really. I, I, whatever. You know, I do enjoy the varied vocal effects on Dave singing, such as those in Set the World Afire, Mary Jane, and In My Darkest Hour. Those are pretty cool. But enough production talk. What about the music? Well, it is definitely the band's most thrash outing yet, in the sense that it's full of open E chugging riffs, you know, punk style backbeat drumming. I really like the track Mary Jane and wish Dave would have developed it further. You know, it's a pretty cool and interesting, almost psychedelic thrash song, if that makes sense. Set the World of Fire is definitely a highlight of Megadeth's career. It's a very fast and punishing track full of great riffs and solos. We also get the first Megadeth ballad, In My Darkest Hour, which is a refreshing change of pace. Dave's singing on this album is his best yet. Hook and Mouth is a great track that must have been extremely, you know, anthemic at the time of the release with all that PMRC drama. But today, well, does the PMRC does it even exist today? Like, I don't even know. It's aged a little bit poorly. I'll just say that. Anyways, it doesn't really matter. Again, we have an album barely over 30 minutes with another three-minute cover song on it. You know, why? Just just give me more music, please. Why do we have to have these cover songs on it? They just don't really fit. I don't really get it. I don't really think cover songs belong in the middle of albums. Put, put them on at the end, you know, if that makes sense. Whatever. Does, doesn't matter. That's just me. My favorite tracks are Hook and Mouth, Mary Jane, and Set the World Afire. I'll give it a 7 out of 10. With a rate your music score of 3.39, round it up times 2, 6.78, which rounds up to 7 out of 10 as well. Intangible score. This album, despite being from Megadeth's classic era, has always been seen as sort of the weaker of the, these albums. You know, it's sandwiched between Peace Cells and Rust in Peace, two incredible, very important albums. You know, it's good and has a few great tracks, but, uh, you know, it just gets overshadowed by the albums around it. And it's just kind of, it's just not as good. And I'm not sure if it was as influential as well. You know, if this wasn't a Megadeth album, would it still be remembered so fondly? You know, I kind of doubt it. Anyways, Intangible Score will give it 7 out of 10. So, my score, 7 out of 10. Rate Your Music, 7 out of 10. Intangible Score, 7 out of 10. For a total of 21 out of 30 points. And Justice for All. Released August 25th, 1988. And Justice for All sounds as cold as the cracked marble on the cover. While some people lament the production of the album, I honestly happen to love it. The guitar tone is so heavy and full that, to be honest, I don't really miss the bass much at all. It's one of my favorite productions of all time. And honestly, even if you don't really like the production, you have to admit that it's extremely unique and recognizable right away. You know, it sounds completely unlike every other thrash record ever recorded. Really good. Metallica here began to experiment with even more progressive ideas in their music, as well as they are laying the groundwork for groove metal here with a lot of staccato, syncopated rhythms played with the guitars and drums all matching each other, such as the Freight Ends of Sanity and Harvester of Sorrow. I would also like to add that the breakdown section in one, you know the part, certainly inspired metal for decades to come after it. James sound his best yet. His voice sounds like a fully grown man now. He's extremely angry, extremely gruff, and full of grit. Another well-done Metallic instrumental here. As well, you know, Metallica lost their longtime bassist, Cliff Burton, during the touring for Master of Puppets. And I think it's clear that losing him not only affected the band and how the bass parts are played, but the songwriting and production as well. You know, these songs are a little bit longer than the ones we got on uh, Master of Puppets. You know, they're a little bit more long-winded. 
a little bit more repetition. You know, I'm not sure if Cliff was kind of reining them in there, but, you know, this is a pattern that continues and goes forward with Metallica. The drums sound great as well, juxtaposed with the reverb drenched so far, so good, so what? These drums sound incredible. Very punchy and dry, they fit the album perfectly. Lars, despite never playing a ride cymbal once, check out my video on that. You know, despite that, he has a very unique and interesting drum patterns, especially on the title track and Justice for All. That one is extremely fun to play. The lyrics are dark, furious, and personal, with Dire Z being the prime example here. I mean, I could go on. This album is great, and I absolutely adore it. However, here you start to see the songs suffer from what I begin to call metalla bloat. You know, where a lot of these songs would probably have been better off if you chopped off a few minutes off them. But, you know, the songs are still good enough and are interesting enough that doesn't really matter that much. But this becomes a problem later on. But despite that, I really still love this album. Favorite tracks? You know, I really like all of them, but we'll go with one, Freight Ends of Sanity, and Harvester of Sorrow. Nine and a half out of ten. With uh, five points deducted for just being a little bit too long-winded in some of these songs. I rate your music score of 3.82 or 7.64, rounded to 7.5 out of 10. Intangibles. The first Metallica music video was released here for one. And man, even today, this is a great video. You know, it's not very often or really ever you get full-on movie footage in a music video. And it absolutely fits the vibe of the video really well. It's uh, kind of a haunting music video, to be honest. This album really influenced metal for years and years to come. The scooped guitar sound, the chugging odd rhythms, the clicky, dry, and punchy drum sound. Really, really good. It loses points as it has become rather infamous for the lack of bass, which personally doesn't bother me, but I can really see why that would bother some people and why they wouldn't like it. Anyways, 9 out of 10, intangible score. So in total, we have... My score of 9.5 out of 10, a rate your music score of 7.5 out of 10, and an intangible score of 9 out of 10. For a total score of 26 out of 30. Rust in Peace, released the 21st of September, 1990. You know, like Master of Puppets, I'm really not sure what else I can say about this album that has not already been said before. Unlike So Far So Good, Rust of Peace, I think, is aged like a fine wine. The addition of Nick Menza and Marty Friedman is immediately noticeable. The album is relentlessly fast, technical, progressive, and heavy. Right away, the production is just way better. Gone are all the washed-out reverb swamp of So Far So Good. Instead, the production complements the music with a tight production, which gives full balance to everyone in the band. Nick Menza's drumming is excellent, as this is one of my favorite air drumming albums of all time. Dave Elfson's bass is also great here, with cool fills and some very cool moments, namely in Dawn Patrol and Take No Prisoners. Dave and Marty Friedman put on an absolute guitar clinic here. Uh, like, man, what else needs to be said? Tornado of Souls contains what is widely considered one of the best solos of all time. You know, just ask so many people online, anywhere you can look up videos. Tornado of Souls is coming up all the time. It's just insanely iconic. It's insanely good. What more can you say? I also really love the soloing in Lucretia, especially the part that sounds like someone's falling down the stairs later on in the song. I think that's one of my favorite solos of all time. That's just crazy, and it's awesome. Dave singing here is also the great. Perhaps maybe the most aggressive he's ever sounded. I especially love his vocals in Five Magics, just incredibly unhinged. A true classic for many, many reasons. I even like Dawn Patrol a lot. For filler track, it kind of allows me to catch my breath before the relentless onslaught of the title track. You know, I'm also pleased to get 40 minutes of Megadeth with no cover songs. Great stuff. Amazing stuff. Just what a great album. You know, what more can I say? Absolute classic. Uh, my favorite tracks, all of them. Easy 10 out of 10. With a rate your music score of 4.02 or an 8 out of 10. Another absolutely criminal score in my opinion. Intangibles. You know, like Master of Puppets, this is just an easy 10. Incredibly influential. This album probably marks the absolute peak higher watermark for thrash metal and acts as a nice bookend for the thrash explosion of the 80s. You know, like Master of Puppets, not much more needs to be said. You know, and I don't really just want to repeat myself or repeat what someone else says. 
whatever. It's a 10. It's a 10. What more can I say? So in total, we have my score of 10 out of 10, a rate your music score of 8 out of 10 for an intangible score of 10 out of 10 for a total of 28 out of 30. All right. So now that we finally left the 80s behind, you know, we've had the four classic albums from each of the bands. You know, we're moving into new era, new uncharted territory, the 90s. You know, things start to get a little bit weird in the 90s, as we'll see. But let's just take a recap and see where we're standing right now. First, we'll start with Metallica. So, Kill 'Em All has 24 and a half points. Ride the Lightning got 27. Master of Puppets got 28. And And Justice for All got 26 points. For a total score out of 105 out of 120 total points. You know, 105.5, they're only leaving 14 and a half points on the table here for four albums. I think that's a really good score. But let's see if they can keep that up. But let's go on to Megadeth now. Killing Is My Business got 20 and a half points. Peace Sells, But Who's Buying got 25 and a half. So Far, So Good, So What got 21 points. And Rust in Peace got 28 points. For a total of 95 points out of 120. So, through the first four albums, Metallica is 10.5 points ahead. So far, the only album that I have also rated lower than the Rate Your Music average is Killing Is My Business. Uh, I just thought that was interesting. Can Metallica keep up the momentum, or will Dave and the Boys be able to rein in the lead throughout the 90s albums? Keep watching and we will see. You know, I have some cool charts coming here to show the scores over time. It'll be good. Let's continue on. The Black Album, released August 12th, 1991. You know, this is a tough album for me. Not because I don't like the songs on here, on the contrary, but this is one of the albums, the few albums, that the radio has absolutely ruined for me. I mean, how many of these songs are just been played to death over the years by rock radio stations? You know, we have Enter Sandman, The Unforgiven, Wherever I May Roam, Sad But True, and Nothing Else Matters. You know, they've all been Bohemian Rhapsody to death. And that's because they are amazingly great songs with great hooks, catchy melodies. You know, they're just great songs. But to me, I don't really ever want or need to hear these songs ever again. Despite this, I went in trying to forget the thousands of times I've heard these songs. You know, firstly, the production of this album is absolutely god tier. I truly don't think a drum set has ever sounded better. Because of the production, every track has immense presence and gravity to it. James sounds like a raving animal at times, in the best way possible. His singing and vocals in general have improved by miles on this album. He sounds incredible. You know, singles aside, which are all great and amazing tracks, especially The Unforgiven, which I don't think I'll ever tire of. Lots of other tracks here just feel lacking in some way. They're just not interesting, and the grand production starts to hinder them almost feeling a bit sterile. The exception here is of Wolf and Man, which absolutely slaps. I mean, some of these songs, besides the singles, are just kind of mid, to be honest. I don't really know what else to say. Regardless, the singles carry the album hard. 7 out of 10. Favorite tracks, all the singles, and of Wolf and Man. Uh, the Rate Your Music score is 3.49 times 2, so that's 7 out of 10. Intangibles. Well, this is one of the best-selling metal records of all time. But never mind that, it's just simply one of the best-selling records of all time, period. Uh, the absolute influence and huge success of all these tracks, I guess is the best way to put it. You know, what can you say? How many hundreds of thousands, millions of people got into metal by hearing Enter Sandman? How many people heard The Unforgiven, bought the album, and got into Metallic? You know, like, it's, it's crazy to think just how far of a reach this album has had. You know, it's an easy 10. The impact on culture this album has is immense. It's an easy 10, and I won't hear it any other way. So, final rating. My score, 7 out of 10. The Rate Your Music score, 7 out of 10. And an intangible score of 10 out of 10 for a total of 24 out of 10. Very good score. Countdown to Extinction, released the 6th of July, 1992. You know, here, instead of the fast and technical thrash of Rest in Peace, we get a more melodic take on the Megadeth sound, which, in no doubt, was in response to the immense success of the Black Album. First thing I noticed when going back through these songs is that I'm pretty sure every song's 
title is a line used in the chorus of the song. Just an interesting tidbit of observation here. And the one that shows you that hooks here are the focus now. You know, it's no longer the riffs and solos and look how fast we can play and look how technical we are. It's focusing on the songs as a whole unit. You know, they already showed us that they can just blow the roof off your house with riffs and solos. So why not just write some catchy hooks instead, I guess? And you know what? They do exactly that. Pretty much every track on here is a part where I want to sing along with, along with some interesting songwriting choices, namely Sweating Bullets and Captive Honor. Both are pretty strange tracks, but uh, the thing I think they work well. You know, it's Day's vocal approach here. It's kind of this sarcastic, half-talking, half-singing vocal approach he starts to do here. It's pretty cool. I like it. But Dave singing also has taken a step up here. You know, gone is the unhinged aggression and rest in peace. Instead, we get a much more melodious and nuanced approach to it. But, you know, there still are some thrashing bangers here. High Speed Dirt, Skin of My Teeth, and my personal favorite, Ashes in Your Mouth. Which, to me, Ashes in Your Mouth can compete with, you know, anything on Rust in Peace and is easily like a top 10 Megadeth song, in my opinion. Easily. You know, all these are pretty good solid tracks, although... Sweating Bullets and Captive Honor are bathed in 90s cheese, which may turn some people off, but, you know, I kind of like this 90s cheese. You know, great album. My favorite tracks are Ashes in Your Mouth, Countdown to Extinction, and Psychotron, 8.5 out of 10. The Rate Your Music score is 3.61, so 7 out of 10, and then Intangibles. Reaching number 2 on the Billboard charts is extremely impressive for a band named Megadeth. You know, in 1992, this album spawned some of their biggest hits, as well as being extremely commercially successful. Although, you know, like Metallica, it it marks the beginning of the end for all the true thrash metal fans. But, you know, it gets a bonus point for using a vibra slap in uh, This Was My Life. I love that instrument. 9 out of 10 in tangible. So in total, we have my score of 8 out of 10, a rate your music score of 7 out of 10, and then an intangible score of 9 out of 10 for a total of 24 out of 30, which is coincidentally the same score as the Black Album. No, I did not plan that. Euthanasia, released the 24th of October, 1994. Now, anyone who's a frequent viewer of this channel knows how much I love and enjoy this album, but despite that, let me just try to be a little bit objective here. Uh, Here we see Megadeth double down and go full-on melodious heavy metal here. You know, you'll see the true thrashers and true metalheads complaining about this album, saying that they sold out. But in reality, this is a lot more similar to you know, Holy Diver by Dio or Screaming for Vengeance by Judas Priest than it is to like any pop music, to be completely honest. But, you know, to me, this is exactly what Euthanasia is trying to be. It's trying to be an an older heavy metal album that focuses more on melody rather than just pure aggression and speed, if that makes any sense to you. You know, it's going back to the OG metal bands before everyone just wanted to be as heavy as possible. But besides that, onto the album itself. I think this is easily Dave's best singing performance he's ever put to tape. Bordering on great singing, um, in my opinion, he sounds great. There are great harmonies, especially in songs like A Tout Le Monde, Euthanasia, Blood of Heroes, and Victory. You know, I just love the sound and production of this album. It is very warm and has lots of added textures and rhythms, notably in the form of shakers and maracas, which I feel add a lot to these songs. Some of the best choruses and hooks in Megadeth's career and lyrics which are far less silly and sarcastic like on their previous effort. Instead, Family Tree, The Killing Road, and Victory sort of all focus on more tangible personal issues. Not to mention that they all have S-tier hooks and choruses. The solos are still great, with Victory and Killing Road being a few examples. Every song is just short and sweet, does not overstay its welcome at all. They're all very condensed, very sharp, very focused which I really think Metallica should have taken notes on going forward, but we'll get to that. This is just a really solid, great heavy metal record. You know, I can go on and on, but I will stop myself before I make this a full-on euthanasia love letter. It's a really, really good album. Although, you know, I can see how some people wouldn't like it, but it's going to get a 9.5 out of 10 for me. Favorite tracks, all of them, but especially Blood of Heroes, Killing Road, Euthanasia and Victory, with a rate your music score of 3.47 out of 10, or out of 5, so 7 out of 10. Intangibles. You know, this album sold well, not nearly as well as Counted to Extinction, but still very good numbers, peaking at number 4 on the Billboard charts. Although, much to my chagrin, the album has not been remembered as positively as that one. 
unless, you know, you're a weirdo like me, I guess, who likes this album. I feel that people think that this album was a direct pipeline to Risk and the demise of Thrash Megadeth, and well, you know, I guess it is. But for me and other euthanasia chads out there, this album is great. You know, I feel like this is a much overlooked album, Megadeth's catalog, but, you know, you can see, I guess, the decline start to take place here, if, if you want to call it that. So I'm going to give it a 7 out of 5 intangible score, despite how much it hurts me. So in total, we have 9.5 out of 10 for my score, a 7 out of 10 from Rate Your Music, and a 7 out of 10 for the intangible score for a total of 23.5 out of 30. Load, which was released June 4th, 1996. All right, now it's time for some fun, if you want to call it that. You know, five years, countless live shows, and millions of dollars later, Metallica released Load, along with a stark image change, logo change, etc. This is where the concept of Metalla bloat really starts to set in for me. You know, let me preface this by saying, you know, longer songs, longer albums are not necessarily a bad thing. Not every album needs to be a focused, condensed, pops, you know, pop album. Not everything needs to be short. Not everything needs to be sweet. You know, sometimes length is good. Sometimes it can add, you know, gravity to a song, blah, blah, blah. But the songs have to be interesting enough to earn the length. And the al- this album here and the ones going forward most certainly just do not for the most part. I mean, this album is just so bloated. We have 14 songs at over 79 minutes. And the real problem is, is that a lot of these songs just do not justify their length in any real way. Too much repetition of not very interesting riffs or yet another wah solo section. Man, it just gets old pretty quick. It suffers from perhaps the worst sin that music can make. It's just boring. You know, the production also suffers quite a bit here. The Black Album sounds amazing and huge, and this just sounds uh, weak in comparison, I guess. Another thing is that people say that this album is inspired a lot by Southern rock and country music, but I think they also often forget that Alice in Chains and grunge influence is all over this record, especially on the house that Jack built and the Thorn Within, among others. The problem again here is that, you know, James is a good singer, but he isn't a Lane Staley level singer. Someone like Lane, who is an ultra charismatic singer with an incredible voice, you know, he can go up, down, whatever, blah, 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 can carry a song like this and maybe some longer songs like on Dirt, you know, and some of these, uh, you know, singer like Lane can carry a slower paced song, but unfortunately it just does, doesn't work well with Metallica here. Although I did enjoy the talk box solo on the house that Jack built. I think the talk box should come back. It's about time, you know, 20 years. Again, the singles here are great. Hero of the Day is a fantastic track. Until It Sleeps is good. I especially like the lyrics on it. King Nothing is another banger. I also quite enjoy Mama Said. The country s sly guitar sections are all really good. The Outlaw Torn would be a fantastic track, you know, if it wasn't nearly 10 minutes long. You know, it's a 10 minute long song and we're already like 70 minutes into the album. Like, man, please just give us a break here. You know, there's just a lot of good stuff here. And if the length was cut down to maybe like 50 minutes, this would have been a whole lot better. Favorite tracks, Hero of the Day, King Nothing, and Mama Said. Five and a half out of 10 with a rate your music score of 2.65. So five and a half out of 10. And Tangibles. You know, this album also sold great. Of course, it's Metallica. But the backlash against this album is intense. You know, just talk to any old rocker type guy. The hatred towards this album and the image which they brought with them was very hot. You know, it was very intense. One of the guys at work, he's like this old rocker guy. You know, he's the same guy who told me, I never listened to Judas Priest album after 1986. You know, I asked him about Load one time and he's just like, never listened to it. So a lot of people just, they just don't, you know, and I get it, you know, you see like long haired, bearded James, and then on, you get some press photos and they have short hair, eye makeup, you're like, you know, kind of what's going on here? It's just weird. Anyways, you know, looking back in hindsight, 20 years, some later, maybe you can see that it might've been a misstep. You know, did you really have to piss off a lot of these people? 
you know, I'm not a successful musician. Who cares what I have to say? Anyways, combined with the fact that Reload, which we would also be getting later, it was just more of the same. Uh, you know, I don't know. Despite it selling really good, I think we just have to give it a 5 out of 10 intangible score. And the 5 really is only from the commercial success that it had. So, in total, my rating is a 5.5 out of 10. Rate Your Music score is 5.5 out of 10. Intangible is 5 out of 10. For a total of 16 out of 30. Almost a failing grade and the lowest score by a decent margin so far. Cryptic Writings, released the 17th of June, 1977. Cryptic, writing, cryptic Writings, man, that is tough to say. You won't believe how many takes that took. <laughs> cryptic Writings continues the trend started by Countdown to Extinction and was perfected by Euthanasia, of uh, being a much more melodious and more focused on the hooks and choruses of these songs rather than just outright speed and aggression. But this time around, we get a little bit more punk influence, a little bit more grunge. You know, there's a little bit more things starting to creep in here. You know, the Disintegrators have cool travel, FFF, all a lot of punk influence in here, probably due to Dave's recent one-off adventure with his other band, MD45, which see my other video on that for more. You know, as well as there's some grunge seeping into the music here, like on Use the Man, I'll Get Even, and Sin. Lots of good material in here, despite it being much weaker, in my opinion, than Euthanasia. Trust, A Secret Place, She-Wolf, and FFF are all low-key bangers in Megadeth's catalog. However, this is starting to suffer from a little bit too much 90s cheese, in my opinion. The weird growling synth and Almost Honest and the disco-esque bass line in I'll Get Even kind of foreshadow what's coming in Risk. Dave singing here is pretty good, still despite some weird choices vocally, namely on Vortex and Mastermind. Like, I don't know what he's doing. It almost sounds like he's like, yeah, I don't yeah. Like, that, though, those vocal tracks are what people who don't like Dave Mustaine singing think all his singing sounds like, <laughs> if that makes any sense to you. But, you know, despite that, at least it doesn't torture me for nearly an hour and a half. It's only 45 minutes long. But to me, it's just lacking whatever special sauce they were using on Euthanasia. You know, there's just a missing je ne sais quoi on here. But yeah, a pretty decent album from Negadeth, and the last of the Rust and Peace lineup album, sadly. Favorite tracks, uh, She-Wolf, Secret Place, Trust, and Have Cool Will Travel. I'll give it 6.5 out of 10. Rate your music score of 3.08, or 6 out of 10. And then an intangible score... Debuting at number 10 was still a commercial success, but to many, the drop in quality as well as the continued distancing away from their thrash roots really diminishes the impact the album has. It is definitely less appreciated than Euthanasia for good reasons. Euthanasia is just this, but done better. And again, a lot of people see this as the direct link to risk, which it is. So, you know, it kind of suffers from that as well. So we'll have to go with 6 out of 10 intangible score. So my score is 6.5 out of 10, a rate your music score of 6 out of 10, and an intangible score of 6 out of 10 for 18.5 out of 30, the lowest Megadeth score so far. Reload, released on 18th of November, 1977. All right, another dose of Metallica and the second part to Load, or the other half of the quad album i'm not really sure how they structured it or meant it to be viewed uh, anyways released about a year or so after load it's a lot less country than load but again suffers from metalla bloat too many ideas not refined enough too many songs dragged out for far too long too many pointless solos too many riffs repeated as ad nauseum you know it's the other half of load so of course it suffers from the same issues it is just boring kind of mid-paced meandering hard rock it starts out pretty decently with Fuel, The Memory Remains, Devil's Dance, and The Unforgiven 2, all of which are pretty good tracks, to be fair, which I, I quite enjoy. Then we get Better Than You, and it's just all downhill from here. Better Than You is just so generic, the lyrics are just flat out, <laughs> like, bad, like, they're kind of almost hilariously bad. I, what, what is going on here? What were they thinking? Again, the rest of the album just suffers from the worst thing you can make in music. It's just bland and boring. Where the Wild Things Are has a cool, interesting chorus, but that's about it to that track. 
it feels to me like a lot of these riffs could be cool if they went a more psychedelic or stoner rock direction. Think of maybe Caius or something. But instead, it all just stays in this plodding, mid-paced mediocrity. We don't even get the interesting country moments anymore, or any of that other flavoring or any grunge stuff here. You know, I legitimately had a hard time finishing this album. Again, it's over 70 minutes. It's just way too much. Cut this down to 45 minutes, it would have been way better. Or better yet, combine Load and Reload into one 50-minute record, and we could have had something quite good and quite interesting as well. Favorite tracks? Fuel. The Unforgiven 2 and The Memory Remains, I gotta give this a 3 out of 10, man. It's just, like I said, I had a tough time getting through this. It is what it is. A rate your music score of 2.41 or 5, and a half, 5 out of 10. A tangible score. You know, this album just confirmed to many Metallica fans that they had indeed lost their edge. And to be honest, they didn't even sell out in their traditional sense. They just wrote 150 minutes worth of boring material and assumed the fans would eat it up. <laughs> You know, there is some good stuff in this album, but like I said earlier, just cut, cut all the boring stuff, cut it all down to 50 minutes, put it all together, you know, refine the stuff here. You know, that's one thing I at least give Megadeth. They're not torturing me with these way bloated long albums, at the very least. And this is just a continuing problem that just continues on. You know, this album gets a bonus point for Fuel being played as a hype song at sporting events still. Still hear that on the radio. It's a good track. Anyways. We'll give it a 4 out of 10 intangible score because it also still sold well because it's metallic, of course. My score, 3 out of 10. Rate your music score, 5 out, 5 out of 10. Intangible score, 4 out of 10. For 12 points out of 30, our first failing grade. And rightfully so, this album is painfully boring. Garage Inc. Now, many do not consider this to be a full-length release by Metallica, but as explained at the beginning, in the name of fairness, we'll include it, so the number of albums isn't so skewed toward Megadeth. This is an album of covers, which notably includes a cover of the old Irish folk slash Thin Lizzy song, Whiskey in the Jar, which, to be honest, is exactly how Load and Reload should have sounded. You know, it's exciting, it's driving, and it's more of like a hard rock. It's not really a metal song at all, and it's good, good to melodies, you know, that's good. That's what they should have done. This cover here is a banger, and it became a huge hit for a reason. You know, you still hear that on the radio quite often. You know, just because it's a thing of covers, I won't spend too much time on here, but, uh, you know, we'll go over some other notable tracks. EPs and stuff that they released in the 80s is also included here. And it's really interesting to hear how much James's voice has changed since then. The cover of Bread Fan by Budgie also bangs. But, I mean, this is mostly an album of covers. Like, what, can, what else can you say? You know, 4 to 10, there's some enjoyable stuff, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an album of covers. I rate your music score of 3.13, or 6 out of 10, and then an intangible score. To me, this just seems like a way to say, like, hey, hey, you guys, we still like metal. You know, here's all these covers of metal songs we like. Remember when we thrashed metal? Yeah, it's on there, too. I don't know. It's a cool release for hardcore fans to see how the music that they loved, you know, shaped their sound going forward, but... Maybe it just seems like a cash grab to me. I don't know. I, you know, what, what can you say? Whiskey in the Jar is a party banger, but I mean, this isn't a new Metallica record, and I'm sure fans at the time were also disappointed that we didn't get more Metallica music. So, 3 out of 10. So, for me, uh, 4 out of 10, rate your music 6 out of 10, and then an intangible score of 3 out of 10 for a final score of 13 out of 10. Risk, released the 31st of August, 1999. Full disclosure, I went back to this album expecting to hate it as much as I did when I was a teenager, you know, sort of like Load and Reload, where I went back and would just confirm what I had already thought, but instead I was actually pleasantly surprised. You know, this comment on my Megadeth Remasters video may have subtly changed my mind as I went back and listened to the non-remastered version, which I could only find on YouTube, which sucks, and honestly this album is not nearly as bad as everyone says it is. In fact, I think there's a lot of pretty good stuff on here. However, you know, there is not a lot of metal left at all here. But that's okay, you know, I enjoy other genres of music. But unlike Load and Reload, this is sort of like hard rock and 90s pop rock, I guess you could say. Done in an exciting and novel way rather than just the bland, meandering pointless, toothless, you know, load and reload, if that makes sense. You know, I really enjoyed Prince of Darkness. It's a pretty heavy and cool track. The Doctor is Calling has some decent riffs. 
And I enjoy the vocal and guitars moving together in unison. It's always a cool effect. I also enjoy some of the choruses on the later half of the album. The two time tracks are also really good, especially time the beginning. You know, I'm not sure if it's because I'm staring down the barrel of 30 next year, but time the beginning actually hit me pretty hard and caused a buildup of emotions, which I was not expecting at all from Risk, so good stuff there. There are a lot of interesting late 90s type sounds going on here with added percussion, synths, extra layers, and harmonies. Actually, a lot of the harmonies in the choruses are very interesting and cool. You know, this is just an album dripping with Marty Friedman's influence, if you go and listen to some of his other stuff. You know, not his cacophony stuff, but more of his later solo stuff. You can kind of uh, hear, you know, what he was thinking more or less in this album. The main problem for me that is, despite enjoying and being a big fan of Dave Mustaine's singing, similar to Load and Reload, I just don't think he has the voice to carry a record like this. Lots of these songs are pretty much pop rock tracks, and his voice just doesn't have that je ne sais quoi needed to carry it. The worst offenders here are Breadline and Ecstasy. The XCC chorus just far overstays its welcome, and Breadline is just way too edgeless. It's, I don't know, it's a, maybe it's trying to be like a Beatles track. I don't know, that, I, that, I don't like that song at all. But, you know, I have to give credit for Megadeth for even trying out these tracks. Crush Him is a good example of how to combine some metal edge, and I guess some disco together to create something unique and interesting. Pretty cool song, I guess. At the very least, this album isn't boring. It's interesting and kind of unique and weird and that sort of like late 90s sort of cringy way i guess if that makes any sense to you but uh yeah you know at least isn't at least it isn't bloated unlike the metallic albums it wasn't that long you know i'll take it yeah you know what actually pretty decent and i was fairly surprised favorite tracks time the beginning prince of darkness and wanderlust i'm gonna give this a six out of ten yeah i don't believe it either rate your music 2.13 or 4.23 times two rounded down to a four out of ten intangibles well this album obviously pissed many people off and i can 100 percent see why even dave mustaine himself admits to that but you know they learned from this album megadeth would be back in metal form shortly enough unlike metallica who just seemed to get you know worse and worse and more bloated i guess it would have been cool if we got seven string new metal megadeth but instead we got the opposite we got you know 90s pop rock megadeth However, you can't ignore the infamous reputation that this album has. You know, it's widely derided as Megadeth St. Anger, I guess. So I'm just going to have to give an intangible score of 3 out of 10. For a total score of 6 out of 10 from me, 4 out of 10 from Rate Your Music, and a 3 out of 10 intangible score for 13 out of 30. Megadeth's first failing score here. All right, uh, but before we move on to the next album, let's just take a quick look at the standings and see how we are doing here. You know, the 90s marked a pretty sharp decline in quality for both bands. In the 90s, metal was in sort of a weird place. There was a lot of weird stuff going on, you know, weird ideas, new sounds being explored. And sometimes, you know, it just doesn't work. But uh, let's take a look at the standings, where we are. So for Metallica, the Black Album scored 24 out of 30. Load got 16 out of 30. Reload got 12 out of 30. And Garage Inc. got 13 out of 20, 30 for a total of 65 out of 120 points for these four releases. In total, added to the 105 points they had earlier, Metallica has 170.5 points out of a total of 240. Megadeth, uh, we count down to Extinction at 24 out of 30. Euthanasia had 23.5 out of 30. Cryptic Writings, that was 18.5 out of 30. And Risk was 13 out of 30. For a total of 79 points for these four, added to their 95 points from earlier, we have 174 points out of 240. All right, well, now Megadeth has taken the lead, but not by much. You know, extremely even and close so far through these first eight albums, which I'm actually pretty surprised about. I was not expecting this. I was sort of expecting Megadeth to sort of run, a, run away in the 90s with the lead. But, you know, the quality of... Metallica albums in the 890 or the 80s, excuse me, has really carried them so far. We can see that both bands declined in the 90s, but the average quality of Megadeth records helped them carry them through the lean years. Megadeth's or Metallica's average score so far is 21.3, and for Megadeth it is 21.75. And the biggest discrepancy between myself and the rate your music score was for Euthanasia, with me rating it at 2.5 points higher than the average rate your music user score. 
which I thought was interesting. Very cool, but let's continue on into the new millennium. All right, so S&M, released the 23rd of November, 1999. Here we get another Metallica record, but this time they're going for something extremely unique and novel, combining their, you know, metal, heavy metal sound with symphonic, a full symphony, essentially. Well, well es not essentially, that is exactly what they're doing. They have a full symphony to accompany them playing their songs here. You know, I won't spend too much time on this album again here, as it is really just a live album, but the orchestra really adds some interesting movement, melodies, and gravity to a lot of these songs, especially to the slower and more spacious load and reload songs, which gives the orchestra lots of space to fill in. It's especially good on The Outlaw Torn. James sounds absolutely fantastic here, especially for a live album. Yeah, good stuff. We got two tracks here. I really and really enjoy No Leaf Clover, but Human was just okay. Good stuff here. Very enjoyable album. The track list is a little strange, notably missing some of the slower, more ballady type songs that Metallica has in their catalog that would actually work really well with the neat symphony. You know, namely Fade to Black, Welcome Home, Sanitarium, To Live Is To Die, and The Unforgiven, all of which would have sounded really good if done in this fashion. But you know, oh well, it's still really enjoyable. What can you say? Favorite tracks? No Leaf Clover, Hero of the Day, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and The Outlaw Torn. 7 out of 10 score with a Rate Your Music score of 7.5 out of 10. Intangibles, you know, this is a very cool concept, but it's still not a new album from Metallica, and nor is it Redemption for Load and Reload. You know, No Leaf Clover's pretty good, but Human isn't. You know, what, what can you say? 4 out of 10 intangible score. So, for my rating, we have a 7 out of 10. Rate Your Music is 7.5 out of 10. And Intangibles is 4 out of 10 for a total of 18.5 out of 30. The World Needs a Hero, released the 15th of May, 2001. All right, back to full-length releases now. The World Needs a Hero is Megadeth's return to form. Marty Friedman's gone now. We got a new guitar player. And, you know, the first thing I really noticed is that guitars retain the sort of edgeless guitar tone that it had on Risk. And, you know, I can kind of look past that and the songs are good. And, well, I guess the songs aren't bad, you know, Dread and the Fugitive Mind and Return to Hanger are all good fast heavy metal tracks. I especially like the breakdown section on Dread and the Fugitive Mind. That is really good and a really cool. I wish, Mental or wish Megadeth would have done that more often. You know, a, a lot of these tracks are kind of more euthanasia era-esque style heavy metal tracks. Which of course, if you've been paying attention, I enjoy quite a bit. Although these tracks aren't as punchy, catchy, or polished as euthanasia was. But... Some of the tracks do suffer from some load and reload tier bloat, namely the closing nine minute track, When, which to be honest, doesn't really justify its length at all. Some pretty cheesy moments here, but uh, you know, they're charming rather than bad. And the calls to Dave from the president's office in The World Needs a Hero, <laughs> and the Midwest emo tier voicemails and A Thousand Times Goodbye or the intro to When are all good stuff. They kind of just make me chuckle and smile like, ah, that's so funny, Dave. You are silly, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I, I was getting pretty tired at this point. Uh, a Thousand Times Goodbye is a banger, though. I enjoy that quite a bit. The chorus is great. Burning Bridges slaps. We get a pretty decent ballad in Promises, although it suffers from Mustaine singing. <laughs> you know, I remember sending this song to a girl when I was 15. Like, you know, that was the only kind of love song I ever, you know, liked. And it was a Megadeth song, so I thought it was cool, you know. Whatever. Anyways, I was 15. Good times. Some risk holdovers here, like Losing My Senses and Moto Psycho. Both songs, I really don't like that much at all. But overall, a pretty decent redemption album from Mustaine. Held back some safe and sterile production. Favorite tracks, Return to Hangar, 1000 Times Goodbye, and Dread and the Fugitive Mind. I'm going to give it a 6.5 out of 10, actually. I rate your music score of 2.58, or 5 out of 10. Intangibles. Megadeth's reputation was definitely hurt by risk, and The World Needs a Hero was a decent attempt to win back some fans with some obvious nods to Hangar 18 and Sweating Bullets on tracks like Return to Hangar and Dreaded the Fugitive Mind, respectively. It debuted at number 16 on the Billboard 200, so I, I don't know, we'll give it a 5 out of 10 intangible score. I think that's fair. So, final rating, 6.5 out of 10 from me, 5 out of 10 from Rate Your Music, and an intangible score of 5 out of 10 for a total of 16 out of 30. St. Anger, released on the 5th of June, 2003. Now, even before I decided to do this video, 
about a year ago, I had gone through a phase of re-listening to St. Anger as I was thinking, is this really as bad as I thought it was? You know, was it as bad? You know, I listened to the album like probably like four or five times at work, you know, at home. And uh, thinking surely to myself, it's not nearly as bad as what others say and what I remember, right? Well, not to disappoint you, but I am somewhat of a St. Anger apologist here. I think there's some really pretty good stuff in here, but it is held back by some truly terrible boneheaded decision making. First off, most obvious and infamous part of this album is the snare drum, or should I say, lack of snare wires on the snare drum. Now, don't get me wrong, I like large, pingy snares. See my video on best snare drums of all time for more on that. But this is just way too much. Not only that is that it's obnoxiously pingy, but it's also way too loud in the mix. Like, if you would have just turned it down a little bit, probably would have been way better and maybe even cool. But, uh, you know, I don't know. And to top it off, Lars is always playing these seemingly double-time snare beats. Like, what, what are we doing here? It just, all it does is add to the monotony of it all. But, you know, enough of the snare talk. Everybody knows the snare is bad. I don't really need to get more into that. So let's move on. What is good in here? Well, first off, there are pr some pretty chunky and groovy riffs. I think they played in drop C and even used a seven string on some of the songs here. And it shows. I really like this. Sweet Amber. Frantic purify the unnamed feeling and the song saint anger all contain some seriously great riffs lots of good vocal hooks on here too especially on the previously mentioned five tracks i also like the super new metal-esque shoot me again very cool stuff it's a lot different from anything metallica has done previously or honestly has ever done since pretty unique i like the verse kind of drums going Doo -doo 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 -doo. that's good i like that cool stuff you know, I could go on and on about a cool section here in this in this song and a part here, blah, blah, blah. But it's sort of just piecemeal. But like I said, there's a lot of good stuff here. However, this, again, suffers terribly from metalla bloat, almost to a fault. This album is 75 minutes long. 75 minutes long, man. And the metalla bloat that was on load and reload is here again. And St. Anger probably suffers more from that than those other albums. You know, imagine this album cut out 30 to 40 minutes of repeated riffs. It would just been so much better. Essentially, this album just lacks any polish. And I know that is kind of on purpose, but really, if someone sat them down, trimmed all these songs to, you know, like five minutes max, they would all be so much better. It turns what is an interesting Sonic album with some strange Sonic decisions, you know, kind of unhinged vocal delivery, you know, filled with rage, filled with burning anger and instead turns it into just an absolute slog and a tiresome slog that just kind of beats you into submission, but not in a good way, just it's too much, man. Again, the worst offender here is certainly some kind of monster. That song could have trimmed like five minutes from it, probably. <laughs> but I mean, some of the songs are pretty good on their own, however, and I would honestly much rather listen to this album than Reload again. My favorite tracks here are The Unnamed Feeling, Sweet Amber, Frantic, and Shoot Me Again. I'm going to give this a 5.5 out of 10. Rate your music rating of 1.81 or 3.5 out of 10. So that's the lowest so far. And Intangibles. Uh, this album and the documentary that came out were so thoroughly embarrassing for the band. I honestly have no idea who thought it was a good idea. The documentary is pure cringe kino, however, if you're looking for something to cringe at, I guess. And, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind, I keep thinking that, you know, maybe St. Anger and the Some Kind of Monster documentary were just all some sort of grand trolling, or maybe it's just some grand art project that the rest of us simpletons just cannot grasp yet, but uh, I think we all know that that isn't true. <laughs> you know, it really turned Metallica into a laughingstock, the butt of many jokes... You know, like, what can you say? It really hurt their, their cred as a band. You know, all of a sudden, Metallica was just very uncool. <laughs> I guess, right? Anyways, 2 out of 10. The extra point is for the infamy of the snare drum, which, by being so infamous, has given this album a lot more notoriety. You know, if it didn't have the infamous snare drum, it might have just been kind of forgotten, like, load and reload, and just, you know, said, like, yeah, that, you know, that stuff just wasn't very good. We're just not going to talk about it. Instead, the snare just gives it some notoriety, which I guess is good in some, some sense. Anyways, 2 out of 10. So for me, 5.5 out of 10, a rate your music score of 3.5 out of 10, and an intangible score of 2 out of 10 for a total of 11 out of 30, which is the lowest rating so far. 
The System Has Failed, released the 14th of September, 2004. Megadeth is back with a brand new lineup, and uh, they come up with a slept-on banger of an album. We're now moving into Dave's political arc. You know, the war on terror is in full swing, and Dave is once again pissed. The album starts out with one of my favorite Megadeth tracks, actually, Blackmail the Universe. I love the movie quote in the middle of the song. Fast and furious riffs. Great stuff here. The whole album has some great riffs and combines, you know, the mid to late 90s era Megadeth hook-based songs with some faster, thrashier riffs. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it just works well together. Kick the Chair, Die Dead Enough, Back in the Day and The Scorpion are all great examples of this. Even the slower, more popular tracks are pretty good. Of Mice and Menace, some interesting harmonies. Truth Be Told and Tears in a Vial remind me a lot of Euthanasia tracks. Pretty good stuff. But while Blackmail the Universe is a great song, the rest of it just sort of sits in the good to average range. Just a decent, solid outing from Dave that if you have not heard in a while, I would go re-listen to it. My favorite tracks here are Blackmail the Universe, Back in the Day, and Kick the Chair. 7 out of 10. Rate Your Music is 3.17, so a 6.5 out of 10. Intangibles. This is a good return from Megadeth, a good throwback record with lots of depth and good songwriting. The song Back in the Day was actually featured in a cartoon show that I saw when I was little called Duck Dodgers. I think that was my first intro to metal ever. You know, I heard it and saw it in the morning while I was eating my cereal. <laughs> but it wasn't until later on that when I heard the song again, I sort of recognized it. I'm like, oh, where, you know, where is this from? Until then I learned it was from Duck Dodgers. Pretty cool. I, I don't know. It gets bonus points for that. So we'll give it a 6 out of 10. So in total, my rating is 7 out of 10. Rate your music is 6.5 out of 10. And an intangible score of 6 out of 10 for a total of 19.5 out of 10. United Abominations, released May 11th, 2007. Another scathing, politically charged album from Dave here. This time around, though, the sound of production is stripped back quite a bit. Most of the time being only just guitars, rather than the layered approach that he did on The System Has Fail. You know, I think this adds to the final product of United Abominations, rather than takes away from it. You know, there's a lot of prophetic lyrics on this album, too. Go listen to my video on... Is Dave Mustaine a Prophet? You might enjoy it. Similar to the previous album, there are a handful of great tracks, and the rest are just mid-level, run-of-the-mill metal songs. Sleepwalker and Washington is Next can easily stand up to the best of Megadeth's catalog. I also really enjoy the title track. It has a great chorus. America Stan is another standout track for me. It has some juicy riffs, interesting lyrics, and some cool solos. Gears of War is the other standout track for me. You know, I like the chorus riff and the haunting, oppressive atmosphere of the song. You know, unfortunately, the rest of the songs are just kind of rather forgettable. The Tu Le Mans redo was unneeded, and I enjoyed the original better. But yeah, a thoroughly solid and enjoyable album with two tracks that I think can stand up to the best of Megadeth's catalog easily. Favorite tracks, Sleepwalker, United Abominations, and Washington is next. I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10. The rate your music score would be 3.00 or 6 out of 10. Intangibles. We're now reaching the albums that I remember coming out and the general feeling around them. I was 13 when this album came out. And I remember seeing the Sleepwalker DLC in Rock Band. Or maybe it was Rock Band 2. I can't remember. You know, people loved it. I enjoyed playing it. Washington is next slaps. I also remember drooling over United Abominations' Dean Flying V at my local guitar store. Good stuff. And it was definitely a respective release when it came out. You know, we're going to give this six and a half out of 10. So uh, we're going to give it a total of seven out of 10 from me, six out of 10 from Rate Your Music, and six and a half out of 10 for our intangibles for a total of 19.5 out of 30. Death Magnetic, released the 12th of September, 2008. Immediately noticeable from the first song is that the riffs are back and the terrible production of St. Anger is gone and replaced with a different production style that a lot of people hate on. You know, it's super compressed, it's clipping like crazy, it's saturated like mad, but for me, at least, the production gives the band back some much-needed edge. This album is fully carried by James' singing, to be honest. The best parts of the album is when he's delivering some mega-catchy verse or choruses, and the worst, most boring parts are when it's just the band playing the usual riff salad. Again, this album suffers terribly from a bloat, as no one told them that songs don't need to be longer than five minutes. No, we don't need to hear that riff again. No, we don't need another pentatonic wah solo. It just gets so tiresome. However, unlike Load, Reload, and Saint Anger, most of these tracks actually have enough good things going for them that the length isn't necessarily a bad thing. The Day That Never Comes, That Was Just Your Life, The Unforgiven Three, and All Nightmare Long feel like they are good lengths. 
pretty much all the other songs could be cut down a few minutes and no one would notice. I think All Nightmare Long is actually a good example of what a song from St. Anger could have sounded like if they had good production. You know, if you think about it and you listen to songs from St. Anger, a lot of these ideas are kind of here too with the, you know, luck runs out parts. I could hear that being on St. Anger. A anyways, the hooks are really strong here. And again, I'll say it again, they carry the album. But man, the production does get grating. Suicide and Redemption is just a 10 minute long riff salad, which again is especially painful seeing that we get a 10 minute instrumental when we are already 60 minutes into the album. Like mercy, please man. But hey, at least this time it's metal. It's fast and aggressive, mixing some of the old Metallica aggression with some black, al black album tier hooks. Definitely not a bad album by any sense. In fact, I actually really enjoy this album most of the time. Another case of Metalla bloat hurting the end product though. Favorite tracks, The Day That Never Comes, The Unforgiven 3, and That Was Just Your Life. 7 out of 10, with a rate your music score of 2.86, or 5.5 out of 10. Intangibles. <laughs> I remember when this album came out, it was like a cultural event, like a Halo 3 tier event. You know, Metallica's resurrection. It was huge. And well, they did return to form in a sense, but in the years since, this album really has become a poster child for bad, modern, loudness wars era type production. And yeah, I can totally see that. Despite this, it sold really well, and I think it's a pretty solid record with some tracks that stand out in Metallica's catalog, for sure. I'll give it a 6 out of 10 intangible score. So in total, we have 7 out of 10 from me, 5.5 from Rate Your Music, and 7 out of 10 from Intangibles for a total of 19.5 points out of 30. 19.5 points seems to kind of be the resting place for these sort of later mid-albums, I guess, from these bands. Endgame, released September 15th, 2009. From the first moments of this album, you know you're from something good. They just start you off with the BANG with Dialectic Chaos. Starting off with the rip-roaring instrumental, it really sets a tone. We get to know new guitarist Chris Broderick as well here in the first track. Some seriously good stuff. Endgame, in my opinion, is the true return to form for Megadeth. Almost all the tracks absolutely slay. Head Crusher, This Day We Fight, Endgame and 1320 are all definite thrash bangers. With 1320 throwing way back to 502 of all songs on So Far So Good. Dave sounds great here. He sounds unbelievably pissed off. The production is great as well. Just enough grit and edge, but it wasn't as compressed or as clipped as Death Magnetic was. It sort of strikes a nice balance between the two. Despite the aggression, we still have some good hooks and melodic moments as well. 44 minutes is a great chorus, and I love the lead going on in the background. The chorus of Bodies could have easily been off Euthanasia. How the Story Ends also has a great chorus. You know, going back and re-listening to this album, I keep think I kept thinking to myself, <laughs> you know, every pretty much every song is good here. You know, I really like the symphonic elements and the hardest part of letting go. And Chris Broderick's solos add some welcome variation, having a much different and varied approach than Kirk Hammack and even Dave Mustaine's was. Really good stuff. Uh, I, I forgot just how good this album was. My favorite tracks here are 44 Minutes, Head Crusher, and Bodies. I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. With a rate your music score of 6 point, or 3.38, rounded up to 7 out of 10. Intangibles. This record I remember being hyped for. We had heard Head Crusher ahead of time, and it really got people excited. Chris Broderick brought in some much needed modern metal sound to the band. Really good stuff, and it left a lot of people pleased. Right around this time was when I saw Megadeth for the first time as well. You know, even Dialectic Chaos was featured in an NHL hockey game. Uh, I think it was NHL 2008 or something. You know, introducing countless teenage boys to Megadeth and Metal. Good stuff. I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10 intangible score. For a total of 8 out of 10 from me, 7 out of 10 from 8-year music, and 7 out of 10 from intangibles for a total of 22 out of 30 points, which is the highest rated album since the 90s. Lulu, released November 1st, 2011. Both 13 and Lulu were released on the same day, so let's just start with Lulu to keep the Megadeth, Metallica, you know, one after the other kind of going on here. And boy, I mean, where do I even start with this? I skipped through it back in 2011, so going back through it, I was now fully determined to have a sane anger moment with this and to try to find some good stuff and become, you know, that guy who is the, the Lulu apologist, I guess, you know, just as I'm sort of a sane anger apologist. Except I didn't. This is just another bloated, meandering, and toothless Metallica record. This is just bloatallica combined with a rambling story from an old man. I mean, Christ, this is 87 minutes long. Almost an hour and a half, man. Oh my god. 
and almost none of the riffs or instrumentals were anywhere near interesting enough to warrant this length. You know, Lou Reed sounds very old here, and I know that he is old, so that is, you know, acceptable. You know, James's backing vocals are almost comedic. You know, I get that Lou Reed is a legend in his own right, but there's just too much oil and water effect going on here. The best, most enjoyable moments are actually when there is the least Metallica going on. Little Dog was actually pretty enjoyable relative to the rest of the album. Iced Honey was probably the best example of what they were going for. But then even that song is just one riff repeated over and over and then nonsense rambling. You know, I get there is a story going on here, but, I, you know, it's just not interesting enough for me to really care. Frustration is also decent, but man, sometimes the lyrics and vocal delivery have me convinced this is just one grandiose troll album. Very tough to get through. I feel like this would have worked better if they went for a hard rock country slash grunge sound they had on load slash reload. That may have worked a lot better, but yeah, I don't know. I think this is just an album that maybe we're best off forgetting, even with my contrarian opinions and trying to find good stuff in this album. It's just really, really tough and an absolute slog to get through. My favorite tracks here are Iced Honey and Little Dog. I have to give this a 2 out of 10, with a Rate Your Music score of 4 out of 10. Intangibles. Most of the goodwill Metallica recaptured was sent packing with this release. Once again, the butt of the joke in the metal world. You know, it did sell 2.8 co- million copies. And making an album with Lou Reed is quite an honor. You know, he's quite a legend in the music scene. But, uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> 3 out of 10, I guess. So in total, we have 2 out of 10 from me, 4 out of 10 from Rate Your Music, and 3 out of 10 from Intangibles. So 9 out of 30 points. By far the worst score so far. And I can almost guarantee that'll be the worst score that we get for the rest of this video. All right, so another four albums in the bag. Let's recap. Metallica, S&M, 18.5. St. Anger, 11. Death Magnetic, 19.5. And Lulu, 9, for a total of 58 points out of 120. Megadeth, The World Needs a Hero, 16. The System Has Failed, 19.5. United Abominations, 19.5. And Endgame, 22, for a total of 77 points. As we enter the home stretch, who will take fin- final victory? Can Metallica catch up? You know, let, let us soldier on here. All right, so 13, released November 1st, 2011. 13 sees a marked decline in quality from Endgame. Noticeable right away to me is that Dave sounds tired. You know, his voice was in top shape on Endgame, but here it's just, hey, you know, he's getting tired and sore. Like, you know, I don't know. It just, it just, it just sounds worse than on Endgame for sure. The production here is also lacking an edge, which is helped along by leaning more towards euthanasia sound rather than the thrasher that was Endgame. But, you know, the production is just lacking here. It just lacks something. I- I'm not too sure how to describe it. You know, some of these tracks on here were demo songs from euthanasia era albums. That being said, and despite all these negatives, there are some pretty good tracks. I really enjoyed Sudden Death. Never Dead and Deadly Nightshade. But I mean, there's just a lot of mid-level stuff here. Not exactly catchy like Euthanasia stuff, nor are they politically charged and angry like The System Has Failed or United Abominations. You know, after the album had finished, I simply thought to myself, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was a Megadeth record. <laughs> you know, at the very least, it was under an hour long. Here we're getting to the point where it would probably really benefit the music if he would tune the guitars down a step or even half a step. Could add some little bit more edge to the sound and hate help Dave out singing. But yeah, 13 was just sort of a forgettable album. You know, there's some highlights, but uh, other than that, it wasn't really much going on here. My favorite tracks are Sudden Death, Never Dead, and Deadly Nightshade. For I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna give it a score of five and a half out of ten, with a rate your music score of 2.72, or five and a half out of ten. Intangibles. I remember there just not being the same excitement for this record as there was when Endgame came out in 2011. I think there was just so much crazy good music coming out from other other subgenres in metal. I think that people were just getting a little tired of the old 80s thrash bands looking to recapture some magic at this time. Although, I do remember seeing Sudden Death being used uh, to promote Guitar Hero 4, or maybe it was a Guitar Hero 5. I don't know, I can't remember, and I'm not going to look it up. 5 out of 10. Total score, 5 out of 10 for me. Five and a half from Rate Your Music and five from The Intangibles for a total score of 16 out of 30. Super Collider, which was released on the 4th of June, 2013. 
Released around the same time I graduated high school, we're officially getting to the point in time where I stopped really paying attention to what all these old thrash bands were doing. There was so much exciting stuff coming out at the time. You know, what was the point of listening to these old bands, especially when the albums ever come, we were just all mid. You know, I was much more, you know, looking forward to Periphery, North Lane, Test Ride, those kind of bands. A anyways, so this was actually my first time listening to Super Collider, if you can believe that. And first off, the production is absolutely sterile and ballless. <laughs> no edge at all here, just sounds dull. I I'm not sure what they did. The album also has a much more distinctly blues or hard rock flavor to it. You know, I'm not really sure how to describe it. Dave also sounds even worse than he did on 13. Like, he sounds like he's barely able to sing in some parts. But, you know, that being said, Kingmaker starts the album off with a bang. We have a few faster tracks here and there, notably Kingmaker, Built for War, and Don't Turn Your Back. But most of them, after this, kind of fall into the mid-paced, heavy metal, kind of bland, boring style. The lyrics are pretty goofy in parts too, especially on the title track, Super Collider. There are two tracks that have, there are two tracks, however, that are a distinct shift and different from most of the other Megadeth songs, even their catalog in general, that being Dance in the Rain and The Blackest Crow. I actually enjoy both these songs as they do do something different at the very least. I really enjoyed the stringed elements in Dance in the Rain and the banjo works really quite well in The Blackest Crow. Good stuff. However, right, the rest of the material here is just forgettable. But honestly, not as bad as some of the people online would make have you believe. Favorite tracks, Dance in the Rain, The Blackest Crow, Kingmaker, 5.5 out of 10 from me. Rate Your Music gets a 2.07 or a 4 out of 10. Intangibles, this album is widely panned and this album was widely panned and ridiculed when it came out from what I remember. It certainly did not help Megadeth draw any attention from my 18-year-old self. You know, it just wasn't exciting. Just regular, old, washed up Megadeth releasing releasing another album. You know, I could just go listen to Rust in Peace. Why would I bother listening to this, I guess? You know, I have heard people compare this to Risk, which is strange to me as they're just completely different. This is just sort of, you know, mid-songs, whereas Risk was just a completely different style and change, you know, if that makes any sense to me, to do. But, oh well. Uh, 3 out of 10 intangible score. So for me, we have 5 out of 10. Rate your music 4 out of 10. Intangibles 3 out of 10 for a total of 12.5 out of 30. Dystopia, released January 22nd, 2016. After about a three-year gap, we get another new release from Megadeth. New guitarist again, Kiko Lor Kiko Lorio Rio Lorio uh, Kiko <laughs> from power metal band Angra fills the gap left by leaving Chris Broderick, as well as ex Lamb of God drummer Chris Adler. Pretty cool. These two seem to have breathed life back into the band. Dystopia to me feels like Megadeth woke up from a nap, took some pre-workout, and headed to the gym. This album is energy, which is very impressive to me as Dave was in his mid-50s here. The production is great. It sounds clean and modern, yet is not as compressed and clipped as Death Magnetic, nor is it sterile like Super Collider. It strikes, you know, a really good metal ground here. Dave sounds good here, and his vocals are helped by the down tuned guitars, which are now in D standard. So pretty much everything he's singing is just down a full step, which really helps him. And it also adds some much-needed grit and heaviness to these riffs. There are a lot of throwback tracks here. Right? You know, a lot of these songs are just hearkening back to old Megadeth, you know, sounds and eras. Dystopia sounds like Hangar 18. Fatal Illusion follows the P-Cells, Good Morning Black Friday formula. Post-American World sounds like it's from United Abominations. And The Emperor throws it way back to Euthanasia. Lots of good stuff here, actually. You know, some questionable lyrics here and there. And to me, this album just sort of blends together, except for a few tracks, which are standouts. The addition of Kiko, though, really adds a nice flavor to the album, especially his classical guitar parts on Poisonous Shadows and Conquer or Die. The album just has a very dark and intense atmosphere about it. Pretty good stuff here. Uh, my favorite tracks are Fatal Illusion, The Emperor, and Dystopia. 6.5 out of 10, with a rate your music score of 3.13, or 6.26, which rounds up to a 6.5 out of 10. Intangibles. I never listened to this album when it came out either, but I did have friends and hear people online say good things about it. You know, it definitely healed Megadeth's reputation a bit after Super Collider. The addition of Kiko really brought some eyes and attention to the band. But man, at the end of the day, it's just another late career album from an 80s thrash band that has some good tracks. But ultimately, it's just, you know, there's other stuff and it's not all that interesting, to be honest. I'll give it 5.5 out of 10 intangible score. 
So in total, we have six and a half out of 10 from me, 6.5 out of 10 from Rate Your Music, and 5.5 out of 10 for an intangible score. Hardwired to Self-Destruct, which was released on November 16th, 2016. After an absence of eight years since a full-length Metallica release, you know, we can all just forget about Lulu again. We don't need to mention that. You know, Metallica released another 70-minute plus Bloat Lord album. It starts out pretty great, though, with Hardwired and Atlas Rise before settling in the mid-paced Black album-esque riffage with And Justice for All song lengths and song structures. When I was listening to this album, it all just kind of blended together, to be honest. Again, like Death Magnetic, it is really just James absolutely hard carrying the band again. He sounds great and gives a great performance, even bringing back a little bit of that late 80s edge to his voice again. However, the rest of the band just seems to phone in the performance. All of Kirk Hammett's solos could honestly have been totally cut from the album I probably wouldn't have even noticed. Lars's playing, except for a few parts, is just extremely laid back and kind of lackadaisical. And the bass? Uh, what bass? I, I don't even notice it. The production is good, though. Although, I think maybe the drums are a little bit too loud, but, you know, here I'm nitpicking. When I'm listening to, like, the 20th pentatonic wah solo in these tracks, you know, you start to look for other things to pay attention to. But, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the faster tracks are easily the best here. It keeps the excitement going throughout the longer song length. And although I really enjoyed the song Confusion, Spit Out the Bone is probably the best Metallica song since 1991. Great riffs and great vocals here on this, on this album. Again, though, like almost every other Metallica release since 1991, this album needs to be like 30 minutes shorter. You know, condense some ideas, maybe combine some song riffs together. Like, again, they're just great pieces, you know, here and there. You know, some piecemeal stuff that is just too, too bogged down and just bloated with endless repetition. You know, pointless solos. Uh, you know, it's just too much again. It's, it's just too long. Just more Metalla bloat. What can I say? I've harped on about this enough. I'm done, I'm done harping about it. Uh, until the next one, of course. My favorite tracks here are Spit Out the Bone, Atlas Rise, Hardwires, Hardwired, Confusion, and Moth to Flame. I'm going to give this a 6 out of 10, actually. Rate your music score of 2.84 or 5.5 out of 10. Intangibles. They sure hyped people up releasing the fast tracks early, and this album surely helped rebuild some of the lost social credibility these guys had gotten after Lulu. But again, it's just another bloated metallic record with a few good tracks on it. The album art is also hideous and terrible, and not in a good way. But hey, at least we got some good thrash tracks, and Spit Out the Bone is really, really quite good. 6 out of 10. So in total, we have my score of 6 out of 10, a rate your music score of 5.5 out of 10, and an intangible score of 6 out of 10 for a total of 17.5 out of 30. The Sick, the Dying, and the Dead, released September 2nd, 2022. Six years after the last Megadeth album, we find ourselves in 2022, post-COVID. Dave Mustaine's now in his 60s and he's giving us a new record. This time, immediately throwing back to the old albums with the long title with ellipses in it. This time, we still have Kiko on lead guitar, but now on bass, we also have Steve DiGiorgio of Death, Control Denied, and Iced Earth fame, among countless other bands as well. He is easily one of my favorite metal bassists, and I really wish Dave allowed him to just go ham and crazy like he was on the Control Denied and Individual Thought Pattern albums. Dave sounds great again, giving us maybe some of his best vocal performances ever, which is even more impressive as he had throat cancer before this album. You know, life in hell, he delivers an absolute clinic with his vocals verging on harsh, like, screamed vocals. Great stuff. This album is chocked full with great aggressive riffs, which the D standard tuning really helps with some added aggression and chunk to them. I mean, the riff in Night Stalkers could have easily been on Rust in Peace. Speaking of that song, the ST feature was unexpected, and I think it works. Uh, I'm not too sure. It's okay. Dogs of Chernobyl is pretty cool. The ending reminds me of a mix of peace cells with the almost talking narration that was used frequently on Countdown to Extinction. It's a cool mix of styles, which I think they should explore more in the future. Soldier On has the staccato rhythms and short solos that remind me a lot of The System Has Failed. We'll Be Back is another fast banger, a track reminiscent of Rust in Peace or even Peace Cells sometimes. However, this album suffers from some bloat here as well. Over an hour long, if you cut it like three to four, the more middling, mid-paced, forgettable tracks, I think this would be a really good album. My favorite tracks would be We'll Be Back, Night Stalkers, and Life in Hell. 
Six and a half out of 10, I'll give it. Rate out your music score is 3.03 or six out of 10. Intangibles. This album definitely gives Megadeth a big boost to the social credibility here. It is very impressive for a man in his 60s after beating throat cancer to release an album like this and sing like that. If this is the last Megadeth album ever, it will leave the band with a nice bookend. But it does seem a little bit bittersweet to me that some of the best tracks are just ones that are throwing back to older styles. New styles are almost impossible for him to come up with or they're difficult. And I just realized my collar was messed up the whole time. Oh, well, I'm not refilming it. So whatever. But, you know, I guess just that's just what it's like when you've been a band for 40 years. You know, you're late in your career. People like to hear the old stuff, the hits. So, you know, give them what they want, I guess. Right. Makes sense to me. So a total of 6.5 out of 10 from me, 6 out of 10 from Rate Your Music, and an intangible score of 6 out of 10 for a total of 18.5 out of 30. 72 Seasons, released April 14th, 2023. All right, man, we're finally on the last album we're doing here, which was seven years after Hardwired, we get 72 Seasons. I was pretty impressed by Lux Eterna when it was first released as a single. You know, I thought James sounded good, and I thought it was a really good throwback to the very early days of Metallica. You know, it was very kill em all. And it gave me hope that it was a very short and sweet song as well. However, upon listening to the rest of this album, well, I was sort of let down. This is like the first time that I think I really hear James's age in his voice. I really think if they make another album, they should tune down from here to maybe E flat or even D. I think that would help James out a lot and maybe give the riffs a little bit more edge. But yeah, the production of this album is very good. It sounds very organic. I really enjoy this production. You know, let's, uh, let's keep this up, guys. Like, this is good. It sounds very organic, a tad loose, and definitely much better than Death Magnetic and Hardwired. Lux Eterna is an actual banger. Uh, I really like that track. It's got a great chorus hook. And look, wow, a song under four minutes. Crazy, who would have thought? I just simply wonder why they don't shorten their songs to this length. They would be so much better. And then you have to play less. You got to work less. I, you know, I don't know, Wh- whatever. I know I've harped on and on about this the entire video, but man, this is just... Another 70 plus minute outing from Metallica. It's just too much. And again, the songs are just not interesting or exciting enough to warrant this. Besides one, which I will get to later. Like seriously, cut out 30 minutes from this album again, and this would be very enjoyable. Okay, but enough of that. You know, what is good here? Uh, One of the good things I noticed was there's some nice Sabbath or even Caius inspired material here that I think sounds pretty good. Namely, Crown of Barbed Wire and Enamorata. Inamorata. Inamorata? I, I don't know. I don't care. Too, it's been too much at this point. I, I'm done. Too Far Gone and Lux Eterna gives examples of what most late metallic songs could be in the midst of, rep, you know, in the midst of endless repetition of mid-riffs. There's usually a three to four minute great song. So, you know, instead of Lux Eterna being seven minutes and they're playing these riffs like three, four, five times, just cut it three minutes in and out. Great. I'm happy, you're happy, the fans are happy, you know, come on. (laughs) These guys really need to hire a producer who isn't afraid of them and to say to these guys, hey guys, stop it. Just end it here. It's okay. That's enough. That's a good song. There's some great riffs. Just stop it. It doesn't need to be that long. Anyway, sorry. We have some tasty and justice for all type leads and harmonies spaced out throughout here and there throughout these tracks. And to his credit, Lars actually sounds much better, and I can finally notice Rob's bass. Again, Kirk's solos could have easily just been omitted. Nothing exciting going on, and is anybody really enjoying these solos anymore? Uh, t- I, I don't know, tell me. But again, this is a pretty decent 45-minute album, stretched out for another 30 minutes. <laughs> My favorite tracks here are Lux Eterna, Too Far Gone, Crown of Barbed Wire, and Inamorata. It, it, in that, that song, 5.5 out of 10. Rate your music score of 2.62 or 5.24, which is rounded down to 5 out of 10. Intangibles, well, this is another bloated Metallica album, but the hype for Luxie Turner was actually pretty cool to see at the time. You know, we had a lot of YouTubers reacting to it, namely YouTubers who are more, you know, along the modern metal side, like, you know, Nick, Nocturn- Nick Nocturnal and Finn McKinty. Those guys even reacted to it. Yeah, it was pretty good, you know. But again, it's just another late career mid Metallica album, which has some golden parts. And is ultimately just hurt by endless metallic bloat. Six out of ten intangible score. I think that's fair. 
So in total, we have 5.5 out of 10, right? Your music, 5 out of 10. And then intangibles is 6 out of 10 for a total of 16.5 out of 30. Results. Okay. So finally, finally, we are done reviewing all these albums. You don't know how long this all took me to listen to all these countless gym sessions, countless dog walking. Oh man, I'm just sick of thrash metal. <laughs> I don't need to hear it again. But let's just recap and go through all the scores. And let's start with Metallica, shall we? So Metallica scores are as follows. Kill em All, 24.5 out of 30. Ride the Lightning, 27. Master of Puppets, 28 out of 30. And Justice for All, 26 out of 30. The Black Album, 24 out of 10. Load, 16 out of 30. Reload, 12 out of 30. Garage Inc., 13 out of 30. SM, 18.5. Saint Anger, 11 out of 30. Death Magnetic, 19.5 out of 30. Lulu, 9 out of 30. Hardwire to Self Destruct, 17.5 out of 30. And 72 Seasons, which is 16.5 out of 30. For a grand total of 262.5 points out of a possible 420, for a grand average score of 63.3%. Uh, you know, that's you know, de definitely not bad. Not a bad score. But uh, what about Megadeth? Killing is my business. We have 20.5 out of 30. P-Cells, 25.5 out of 30. So far, so good. 21 out of 30. Rust in Peace, 28 out of 30. Countdown to Extinction, 24 out of 30. Euthanasia, 23.5 out of 30. Cryptic Writings, 18.5 out of 30. Risk, 13 out of 30. The World Needs a Hero, 16. The System Has Failed, 19.5 out of 30. United Abominations, 19.5 out of 30. Endgame, 22 out of 30. 13, 16 out of 30. Super Collider, 12 out of 50. Dystopia, 16.5 out of 50, and The Sick, The Dying, and The Dead at 18.5 out of 30. So, for a grand total of 316.5 points out of 480 possible points, for an average of 65.9%. Well, there you have it. Megadeth wins. <laughs> After all that, they only beat Metallica by a slim margin of 2.6%. They also beat Metallic on grand total points, but they have more albums, so that makes sense. You know, here we can see for the Metallica graph here that they start off very strong, peaking right around with Master of Puppets and Ride the Lightning being very high-scoring albums. Same with Injustice for All and the Black album, and then followed by an extremely sharp decline from Load Reload, you know, with some little bit of redemptions on SM, Death Magnetic. Lulu really drags the score down. So does Saint Anger. You know, also Reload. Uh, you know, there's a definite downward trend for Metallica's albums here. That ends itself at 72 seasons, being ranked where it is. And uh, let's take a look at Megadeth here now. Megadeth is a lot more, uh, how would you say, consistent. You know, we have a few peaks here and there. But the, the lows aren't nearly as low, and I think the highs aren't nearly as high. Well, besides Rust in Peace, of course. But, you know, Metallica's consistency in the early days was really, really quite good. And then we're followed by, you know, Megadeth, we had a little dip in the late 90s. Followed by another dip when Dave's voice got a little tired in the late, uh, you know, early 2010s. But yeah, my final thoughts. All right, so wow, you know, that was a ton of work. And if you allow me just to give you a few more final thoughts. You know, the main problem here is just the absolute bloating of the later Metallica albums. Like, truly, if they trimmed them down, condensed them, made their songwriting a little bit more focused, I think Metallica's albums would be far better than Megadeth's. But, you know, if we're allowing changes to these albums, then, of course, Megadeth would change. Anyways, we could just get on and on with this conversation. Megadeth is better. That's the end of it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I considered omitting Lulu when I went back and re-listened to it. I'm, I was thinking, is this actually a Metallica album? But, you know, Metallica's on it. They endorsed it. They sold a whole lot of records. They made a lot of money from it. So you know what? It is a Metallica record. And I don't really care what you have to say. It is. It's part of their legacy. So you just have to deal with it. It's, it's part of it, right? But, you know, if you exclude Lulu, 
Metallica's average actually eclipses Megadeth's, which is interesting to me. But hey, this is real life. You have to include all the stuff. <laughs> you know, you can't just forget something happened because you want it to. That that's not the way it works. But whereas, you know, Megadeth has been much more consistent over the years with just a few missteps. Personally, for me, I would almost always rather listen to a later Megadeth album than a later than a later Metallica album. Maybe if I'm listening to one or two tracks here, I might pick, uh, you know, The Day That Never Comes or Spit Out the Bone. But if we're talking about, you know, putting on an album and listening to it, I just have to go with Megadeths. You know, the length of these Metallica albums just really, really gets to me. It's, it's just way too much. And especially when there's just not a lot of interesting stuff going on, especially with like the soloing. You know, to Megadeth's credit, they always had interesting and unique guitar players coming through, adding their own particular flavor to these albums, whereas, you know, no shade to Kirk, he's obviously a very influential and great guitarist, but, you know, let's spice it up a little bit here, you know what I mean? I also do see the irony in me complaining about Metallica bloat so much, and then me making, like, a two-hour-long video, or however long this is gonna be, I haven't edited it yet, on it, you know, like, I, I do see the irony of it, but whatever, it's my video. I don't care. To the surprise of no one, both Rust in Peace and Master of Puppets are both tied for the highest ranked album. Again, to the surprise of no one, Lulu is by far the lowest ranked. Uh, Risk is the lowest Megadeth album. Again, to the surprise of no one. But uh, honestly, yeah, the end score was far closer than I anticipated. When I was first beginning this, I was actually expecting Metallic to take the crown. You know, I thought Super Collider was way worse than it was. I also thought Risk was way worse than it was. And, you know, I was also hoping that like, Lulu would have been better than it was, but actually turned out that Lulu was way worse and Risk was way better than I thought. You know, it's just kind of funny how your preconceived notions of these albums can, can influence your thinking. But yeah, I, I, I did think that Metallica was going to take this, but in the end, Megadeth, although Slim, does take the crown. You know, was there another rivalry anywhere close to this? Like, you know, maybe Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Halloween, Blind Guardian, maybe? If there's another rivalry like this, let me know. I'll gladly do another video like this on that rivalry. I think that'd be interesting. I think I'm just rambling on now, so let me just wrap this up. You know, this video was a ton of work, so leave your favorite track from each band in the comments so I know you made it this far. Hit that like button. Hit me with that sub. We're going to have a good time. I got lots more coming up in the new year. 2024 is going to be a glorious year. And yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm going to go listen to, I don't know, something completely different. I'm just so tired of hearing thrash metal and pentatonic licks and other things like that. You know, I just need a full cleanse. And maybe in a few years, I'll make a follow-up album to this or I'll make a follow-up video to this. Go through, re-listen to some of these albums, see if my scores change at all. But, uh... Anyways, this has gone on long enough. My name is Varvis. Thank you so much for tuning in. Cheers. Have a great rest of your year. Have a happy new year. Cheers, you guys.